Let us take hands and walk together down a tree-lined lane at dusk. The lane passes by two tall houses that can only just be seen by the twinkle of lights in the dim. One house is brimming with life. The other burns its lights without need. Forever and ever, for the dust and the mold. Will the owners ever return? Or can they never leave? Someday, friend, you'll know. Till then, discover the delight of drawing with Dolores. Greetings, listeners. Today, we're going to draw a moonlit night scene, as seen from the window of a train. So if you would like to draw along with me, I would invite you to take a piece of paper and a pencil and put on your listening ears. Okay, here we go. So first, you're gonna, you're gonna take your paper and your pencil. And first, you're, you're going to draw a large squarish oval. It's a, a squoval. And this is gonna take up most of the room on your paper. And it uh, doesn't have to be perfect. Just do the best you can. And that uh, will be fine. This is going to be um, our train window. So I'll give you a minute to do that. So now you have your squ squoval. And what you're going to do next is you're going to draw three horizontal lines towards the bottom of your scroll. These are going to go all the way from edge to edge and uh, towards the lower third. Space them evenly apart, okay? So now I want you to draw vertical lines. That's up and down. And I want you to draw those from the top horizontal line to the bottom horizontal line. You're going to draw about six or seven of these spaced evenly apart. So, uh, and what we just made there, a fence on a, a farm that the train is, is passing. Okay, what you're going to do next is you're going to go up towards the top. Well, the upper third, but the left half of the upper third, and you're gonna draw a big circle, okay? Don't worry if the lines are messy. In fact, you know, trace around that circle a few times. There you go, there you go. All right. That's gonna be the moon. It's a full moon, it's a beautiful night. Let's draw another moon to the right of it. Train windows, they got multiple layers, and at one thing and you you see the two because it's reflected so we've got the moon and then the reflection of the moon on the right we're almost done so what we're gonna do now so we're gonna turn our drawing upside down that's right now I I like to put a little love in all of my drawings I think I think we could do with a lot more love in the world so, once you've turned your, your train window upside down, I want you right in the middle of it to draw a heart. There you go. That, uh, it's upside down so nobody expects it. And if you turn your drawing back up again, you've got... Oh, shit. Oh, God. Every... You know, what matters is that it's from the heart. And, uh, I will be here next time. Story time, everyone. Story time. Today's story is The Dust Mother, and it may be disturbing to some listeners. Mother had returned from the market 
and already she was screaming. Mother was always screaming. Today would be particularly bad because Penny had forgotten her plate of toast on Mother's sewing table. She only meant to leave it there for a moment while she reached for a book, a book she wasn't allowed to touch, but Mother wasn't home at the time. Well, Penny found the book, and she got lost in its wonderful stories of faraway places she'd rather be than here, and she forgot the toast on the sewing table. Oh, dear. Nothing made Mother scream louder than when her things were disrespected. It was too late for Penny to fix it now, First would come the pounding of Mother's footsteps on the stairs. Boom, boom, boom. Then the stomping of her heels on the hallway floor. Stomp, stomp, stomp. Then Penny's door would fly open until it hit the wall. There was already a dent where the knob had struck it countless times. And then Mother would stand there with her long arms down at her sides, her nostrils flaring like a horse's, and her pupils big and black like a cat's. And she'd scream. What have I told you, she'd say, and it wouldn't matter how Penny replied. That was the trouble, you see. Penny was fairly accustomed to Mother's screaming, but she never knew what to say in reply, and this made Mother scream even more. Straighten up, she'd scream. Well, say something. What are you thinking in that head of yours? You're thinking bad thoughts about me, I can tell. I can always tell was also exhausting. After Mother would leave, Penny would sit and cry, just because she was so very tired. She didn't do her crying where Mother could hear her, though. Crying, Mother said, was for babies. When Penny needed to cry, she went away to the Grey Room. The Grey Room lay just beyond the dark space beneath Penny's bed. You could only reach it by sliding on your belly through a warm, heavy darkness until you came out from underneath another bed on the other side. This other bed was just like Penny's. The room that contained the bed was just like Penny's, too, with a matching desk and a shelf full of dolls like hers and lots of books. Of course, you couldn't read the books. They were made of dust. Everything in the room was made of dust, except the window, which was cobwebs. Through holes in the cobwebs, Penny could see a garden full of dust roses against a background of rolling dust hills and little dust animals that waited still and quiet in long shadows cast by a setting mothball. Everything was silent here, and that was what made it so nice. Nothing pounded upstairs or threw doors into walls or screamed. It didn't matter if Penny left her toast behind. She could simply push the dust back into place if it left a mark. Not that it mattered anyway. There was no mother here. Mother couldn't reach Penny's gray room, because mother couldn't fit under the bed. Not easily. Maybe with a good hard push. But she wasn't very likely to stoop so low in the first place. And that meant Penny could come here whenever mother left her alone. And she could sit amongst her dust things and admire the dust animals beyond the dust garden. And she could cry real tears until she didn't need to anymore, in a world where the only sound was the occasional rustle of moth wings. Penny would stay forever if she could, but she couldn't. Things that weren't dust had a way of becoming it once they'd been in the grey room long enough. And isn't that just the way of nice things? Anyway, it was too late for Penny to go to the grey room now. There wasn't even time to fetch the offending plate, for Mother's steps were already on the stairs. It was just like always. What are you thinking? Why don't you have anything to say? How dare you disrespect my things? I'll disrespect your things just to show you how it feels. But then, she said, I'll start with the space under your bed. Mother said she knew that Penny liked to hide under her bed. Did Penny think she had secrets? Oh, no, she couldn't, said Mother. She could never have secrets. And to prove it, Mother would board up the base of the bed so that Penny couldn't go under it again. No, but Mother was wrong. She couldn't know about the Grey Room. She couldn't understand why Penny began to cry, either. It was only a bed, she said. Only a bed. But Penny would have to straighten up. Company was coming tonight. And Penny would have to sweep the carpets before they came. She'd better not cry while she did it. Fortunately, Mother's company would keep her distracted and unable to board up the space under the bed just yet. There was still a little time left. 
Penny sat alone in the dust garden beneath a tree that was made of a giant rotten orange on a trunk of stale cinnamon stick. She watched the animals in the long, dusty shadows, and she began to feel very sad. I'm sorry, my friends, she said to the dust animals, who never answered. But I can't come back after this. Not ever. That's just the way it has to be. She cried her real tears, and she wiped her eyes and returned to her real world, got ready to sleep, and then climbed into her real bed. But sleep wouldn't come. She couldn't sleep, because tonight... She was thinking bad thoughts about Mother. Penny sat up, listened for sounds of conversation from below, and then crept to her closet where she gathered her shoes and stockings. Then she slowly, quietly pulled her traveling trunks from the wardrobe, filled them with whatever she possibly could, and placed them next to her bed. The next morning, Penny would be expected to clean up the mess left behind by Mother's friends. There would be sherry glasses and cake crumbs everywhere. They left such a mess, Mother's friends. They never respected Mother's things, but they didn't get screamed at and threatened. No matter, Penny thought. She would take the punishment for them. Today, in fact, she intended to do exactly that. While Mother readied herself for her day, her radio playing romantic tunes all the while, Penny picked up the leftover cake from those delicate little china plates. Yes, she took that cake. And she crumbled it all over Mother's carpet. Then she found a half-full sherry glass and poured the liquid all over the armchair. And as a grand finale, she grabbed all the little china plates and threw them hard against the wall. She enjoyed that part most of all. This one was for the screaming. That one was for the stomping. And these were for the gray room. Mother's radio stopped at once. But Penny was quicker, and she raced up the steps back to her room where she waited. From below came the first scream. Then came the footsteps on the stairs. Then the stomping down the hall. And finally the door burst open wide with a crack against the wall. How dare you, Mother screamed. How dare you, how dare you, how dare you. It was then that she noticed Penny's legs under the bed. She wanted to know what Penny had to say for herself, but Penny's legs didn't move. How dare you ignore me, screamed Mother. She dropped to the floor on her belly and reached under the bed for Penny's feet. Only they were not Penny's feet at all. They were Penny's shoes and stockings stuffed with dust. Penny would like to have seen Mother's face when she realized, but she couldn't see her face from behind as she shoved Mother with all her might all the way under the bed. Then Penny pushed her waiting traveling trunks under the bed after Mother so that Mother couldn't find her way out again. All the while, Penny could hear Mother screaming. It sounded muffled and far away, but it was there just the same. Screaming, screaming, screaming. Oh, didn't she ever tire of it? But it had to end eventually. It was only a matter of waiting now. Soon the dust would gather and nibble away at Mother's realness and replace every inch of her with itself. There would be peace and quiet. Finally. Penny didn't know how long it would take for Mother to turn to dust. She supposed that when the screaming stopped, the deed was done. But what a pity, she thought, for the gray room had been hers. It didn't seem right that Mother should have it all to herself now, screaming at her dust animals and stomping all over her dust roses, disrespecting her things. It just wasn't fair. Penny sighed, sat on her bed, and waited. When the screaming stopped, she would continue her chores. All she had left was the sweeping. Let's listen in on our inside voices. Mm, today is going to be a long one. Use another cup of coffee. Wait, have I had two already? Mm, I don't remember. Mm, whatever. I need to walk away from this guy for a sec anyway. God, he's so hot. Would he even be into me? I mean, I'm not like super model pretty or anything, but I'm okay. I'm nice. It doesn't matter. He's super inappropriate. But jeez, that face. He must have so many women crying over him. Why would he even notice me? Grey, not a coffee. Earl Grey it is. Who was Earl Grey? Was that even like a person? He's just so beautiful. 
beautiful over there, so perfect. And he's never going to acknowledge me. What would I even say? I am Karen. I don't know if you remember me, but I did your makeup. What do you like to do for fun? <laughs> I need to get out more. Just look at him. Oh, I wish I could be there tomorrow. I love a man in a suit. We talk about improper employee client relations, right? I guess I could go with the old the heart wants what it wants line, or it's what his heart would have wanted. <sighs> oh, such a beautiful face. I'm not gonna cremate him. And now, ask. Audrey from Minnesota writes, Today, my girlfriend broke up with me. She delivered the news by phone, and I was already late for an important exam. I was so upset about it that I'm pretty sure I bleeped up the exam. This was literally the last thing I needed. Why do bad things happen to good people? Dear Audrey, I'm here for you. But you're not asking the right question. The question isn't, why do bad things happen to good people, but rather, would there be good people without bad things? Imagine that your sweetheart had not unceremoniously crushed your heart and your educational ambitions all at once. You would have known no impediment to your lifelong dreams. You would have graduated with honors and moved on to an enviable career with a lifestyle commensurate with your astronomical income. You would have succeeded, my dear, and how. Your unhindered success would have afforded you a mansion the size of an athletic field, staffed by scores of poor fellows less fortunate than yourself. You wouldn't notice them. They would have had no obvious effect on your life's trajectory. And so it would make little difference to you if their days were ruined after you insulted the head of your staff over a missed blemish on your grand staircase banisters. Perhaps he missed this spot because his girlfriend once entered their amour before an important exam instead of yours. And this particular day was the anniversary of it. The poor man never forgot her. But you wouldn't care about that. Indeed, in this hypothetical scenario, it's been a tiresome day for you. So you let the man go for the mere irritation of seeing that blemish when everything else in your life has been so perfect and without challenge. This man has taken such caprice from you before, but today is the straw that breaks the camel's back. He's been predicting this outcome for a while, and as your head of staff, he's well aware of all your activities, that your unfettered triumphs have left you feeling empty, and so you've sought more and more by any possible means. He's had access to all your doctored red tape, your hush-hush business conversations, your receipts for nights out with ladies who were not your girlfriend. Oh, he stored it for quite some time, and has determined that today is the day he'll distribute all of it to the necessary departments and individuals. It will all end badly for you. As you sit in your prison cell, the girlfriend who never dumped you will say that if you rot there, it will be too soon. And you'll ask yourself, as you did now, why do bad things happen to good people? Only it will not apply to you, Audrey, because you are not a good person. And that is why bad things must happen to good people. I hope this brings you comfort. If our friends listening at home would like to submit a question, you may do so by sending your thoughts into the wind, or by wishing upon a star, or by sending a letter to ask at goodnightdearmargaret.com. Tell me a story about a walk in the park when you were alone. A walk that wasn't always walked alone, but now it is. Why are you alone now? Who walked with you before? Was he a lover? Was she your spouse? 
Were they a beloved family member, or perhaps a trusted friend? Did they die? Did they no longer love you? Did they move away and forget you? How will you find solace in the yawning emptiness of this void? How will you deafen the scraping of memory's claws? What color was her hair? Tell me that story. Tell me that story now. And now it's time to go back. Before we reach the end of the lane. I'm sorry that I have to leave you, friend. But thank you for coming along. Good night, good night, dear Margaret. May angels bring you dreams. And when comes the sun, dear Margaret, we hope they'll allow you to wake. Good Night, Dear Margaret is written, produced, and narrated by me, Katie Towell. New episodes are posted monthly with a bonus episode for Patreon patrons. To learn more, including how to subscribe and support the podcast, visit goodnightdearmargaret.com. Thank you.